uh, we saw seatbelt fragments. There was parts of armrests and seatbelts from the planes, and those were those were pretty compelling because you had no idea if this was a seatbelt from a flight attendant or from a terrorist, um, and you couldn't identify most of the material which plane uh, the objects were from. They found a number of airplane parts uh, at Fresh Kills. You could tell the fuselage pieces, they were these bright lime green colors. And there was a guy there from American Air Airlines who built airplanes. And what he did day in, day out, is they would bring suspected piece of metal to him and decide if this was part of a plane. Uh, they found some, a very large wing section, probably 100 pieces of fuselage, some with windows uh, in it still, and two of the engines. There were some of the plane tires as well. They weren't investigating this like a, a usual plane crash where they try to figure out why the planes crashed. They, know, they knew why these planes crashed, so it wasn't a safety issue. Uh, but they were very interested in keeping all the plane parts that uh, they could find. Sometimes you would see um, a lot of shoes around. Uh, it seems like a small thing, um, but, it, but it was pretty, that was memorable. I was first there uh, in late October 2002 was the first time. And they, they let us see a vehicle. They sent us around with a police department sort of chaperone. He escorted us around. He escorted us and wouldn't let us out of the vehicle. We couldn't take photographs. They told us if we took pictures, they'd take our cameras the first time in. And we saw the vehicles for the first time that day. And he drove us up and down the aisle. And there seemed to be 20 or 30. And we were astonished. And we returned a week or two later and saw probably twice that many as they would bring them from downtown, every week there would be more and more. Within about four weeks, they had given, given me permission to begin taking photographs of just the vehicles. And so we would spend days there looking at them and photographing them, as much of them as we could. You'd return the next week, and there would be um, more of these seemingly endless uh, stream of vehicles that were making their way to the hill until there was about 100 of them. Uh, they found many human remains in these vehicles. Uh, and for some people, the contents of the glove compartments was all that the families would have. So the vehicles were especially important. One of the FBI agents called them sponges, that they somehow collected these remains and parts of people and part of their belongings. And so they were especially important. And they searched them every day for 10 months. A number of the destroyed vehicles had belonged to the US Secret Service, FBI, undercover uh, police department detectives, and these were treated very differently. They were sorted in um, a secure area within Fresh Kills where many of the detectives weren't even allowed to be. Um, in every car, there was evidence of a life. The FBI was also very interested in searching every vehicle for evidence of connection to the hijackers. Every vehicle's VIN number was checked. They looked in the glove compartment and searched each car to, to find out if there was some activity on the ground from the terrorists, which there wasn't. The FDNY vehicles were remarkable. These, there were enormous ladder trucks, pumpers that looked like they were thrown around the fields like toys, and they reeked of unimaginable loss. Uh, for the most part, you got a sense of enormous weight uh, an enormous structure in these trucks because they were built of such solid material. Uh, and when you, you know, we went inside a number of them and you'd find business cards blown in them from the Trade Center, pieces of steel. Uh, and then everyday things like somebody's shoes and a, a water bottle or uh, uh, a cooler in the back that still had water bottles in it. So there's a, an immediacy about them as well. Uh, that was just uh, unescapable. We spent days with them. The vehicles were out of service. They were either so destroyed, there was nothing to be left of them. Some of the hose was scrapped and, and taken out, and they were going to recycle the metal. They were also contaminated, so they couldn't go back to any of the companies or back to the department. They did their best to find you know, any human remains, and these weren't remains of the firefighters, but from other people in the building. So they would go through them find all the remains, wash them out, find anything they could, and then they shred, they, they tore them apart to recycle the metal, uh, basically. So c giant machinery would, would come in and tear them apart and tear the wheels off them, load it into back loaders and bring it down to, out to trucks and barges and take it away. So uh, every week they, the, the fields got more organized and sort of sterilized as June and July went on until it was all gone.
and they were done. The recovery operation ended as quietly as it began. The debris removal at Ground Zero ended on June 28th, and the sorting of fresh kills officially ended on July 26th at 1.07 p.m. They carefully documented that, that time uh, because it was such an enormous task that, that they had uh, accomplished in, in just about 10 months. They didn't know if it was going to take them two years to do this. Uh, in the end, of the 1.8 million tons, uh, they found 4,257 human remains that led to the identification of over 400 people uh, through DNA. Um, over 4,000 photographs, over 54,000 uh, pieces of personal property, things that belong to individual, 54,000 pieces, and 1,358 uh, vehicles, both civilian vehicles and department vehicles, were processed, were inspected and processed. When they were done, or nearly done, they went around and actually dug up the top two feet where all the sorting uh, machines were in all the, all the sheds and sorted all that material again and actually found more human remains and then put all that back out in the field to bury. So, in essence, the remains of the World Trade Center are underfoot at Fresh Kills. From that, they removed every reasonably sized human remain out and every personal object that they could find. Um, but what's left is still underground. The minute we saw it, we thought it was important to, to save it and be seen, you know. The minute they, they, we got there and wouldn't let us take our pictures, we planned to figure out a way to get back there and take photographs because we felt very strongly this is something that m must be seen, must be saved. These images uh, must be preserved somehow. M most people don't see a crime scene, and no, uh, very few people saw that. Uh, so it's, we think it's important um, to, for people to see kind of, kind of every piece of what happened.